Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Tech Tactics Live, episode 75. And we are not at PCA National Headquarters tonight. We're at a very special location, which I'll mention in just a bit. Tonight, you're watching tips and secrets from a professional detailer. Just like me, I'm always looking for tips. It's never a subject that you get tired of, and we're gonna learn quite a bit tonight. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. We wanna make sure we thank Pirelli. Without their sponsorship, none of this would happen. And of course, we'd love your support. Speaking of episode 75, we've recently crossed over 75,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't already, please subscribe. If you enjoy the show, be sure to hit the like button. And of course, please comment. For those of you that are watching live tonight, I'll be monitoring the live chat on my phone here so that if you have questions, our guest tonight will be able to answer them uh, on the fly. And also we have Robert and Manny and Damon in the house that's gonna help pull all of this together. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest, Rod Kraft from Grio's Garage. Our sales manager, I think, is our technical title, but really he's a friend that's been at PCA events, be it Tech Tactics East, you've been to Parade, you're at uh, Works Reunion Amelia, and you've got an amazing garage here, and that's why we're here. For the longest time, you've invited PCA to come up and kind of check out your working garage, and you have so many cool projects here. Uh, hopefully we can have a wide shot for you to see. We've got a Z car, we've got this super bad car with the huge blower and what you said, a 477 cubic inch motor in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a bad car. Um, so, but, if you look around, there's a few detailing supplies here. And the reason being is you've been in this, and I'm not gonna be completely truthful, yeah, I'm, gonna say 30, wanna... I'm gonna say you've been in the detailing business for 30 plus years, how's that? That's a safe number. A safe number. <laughs> All right, so let's just um, throw up the agenda and let you guys know what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So Robert, the agenda, uh, some r basic rules of detailing, products that every home detailer should have, some of Rod's favorite tools for any detail job, and probably the do's and don'ts of detailing. And like I said, he's been to a lot of our, our events, and I know you go to other car club events and car manufacturers, and you, you're at the booth. You're usually with the Griot's garage display and answering thousands of questions weekend after weekend. So we only have an hour. Uh, we've got lots of stuff to cover. So right from the start, why don't you throw down some rules of detailing? So to me, the basic rules of detailing really imply um, going after and looking for the right product. So I, th I think when it comes to detailing, for a consumer, somebody who's not properly trained in detailing, they typically go to the store, they're kind of confused by the wall of confusion, I call it, when they're looking at detailing products. And so they don't know which product to use, what kind of soap, what kind of wheel and tire cleaner. So I think if you can read the label, that to me is the most important thing, read the label and do a little bit of investigating on what it is you're trying to clean and make sure you really figure out um, tackle that plan ahead of time. So I think the most important thing for me is a proper wash mitt. And so I'm not a big fan of using sponges to, to wash a vehicle. Sponges can trap dirt that are just up on the surface and they can rub them back into the paint. So a good quality wash mitt, something that's got a nice thick nap to it, whether it's something like this or something with these little microfiber fingers are really good. Um, so those are something that I think are very important. And also a good quality car wash. Mm -hmm. You can't go wrong with that. The one thing you definitely want to avoid is a dish soap. So I've heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, you might want to consider a dish soap if you're looking to strip the car down of everything that's on the Bingo. car. Bingo. That's exactly But that's right. really the only time you would use right. it. Right. So if your goal is to strip the wax off and any of the protectants, dish soap is definitely going to be your product. But the worst thing about that is, even though it delivers a lot of suds to the average consumer, they're going to think, oh, it's cleaning my car, which it truly is but it is gradually starting to strip that wax protection off of there. And so you're gonna wonder why your wax isn't lasting long and you're gonna probably blame the wax and not the soap that you were using. Yeah, and the, that was made for your kitchen and not to be in your garage for your car. Right, so all dish soaps are typically some sort of an alkaline-based product and alkalines are strong. They're gonna strip that, that protection off of there. So you talked about wash mitts. Um, you know, I think we all started with the old kind of sponge and, and probably had a couple of them and they always got nasty and gross. Now, although this is a nicer material, after using them a lot, 
they also can get nasty and gross. So is there sort of a maintenance routine that you do with these? Yeah, so believe it or not, when I'm done using my wash mitts, I actually wash them and clean them, which is kind of weird. When you're thinking you're cleaning a car, the wash mitt should stay clean, but this is gonna get a lot of dirt in it, so I will rinse this out thoroughly, and I will actually wash it through my regular washing machine on a separate cycle of, without my clothes, of course, and I'm gonna wash these independently on their own, and that way, when they're done, they're clean and ready to go for the next job. Okay. So. Very good. Um, so do you mind if I jump over to oh, this side? Because I see something from my past. Yeah, that's, and so, that's old school right there. Old school, I remember in middle school, wash the car, rinse it off, and then my dad had these leather chamois. Yeah. And they did absorb a lot of water, but I haven't used one of these in forever. Like, do people still use this? They, they sure do. And unfortunately, this is something I, I pulled out of my closet of... Uh, I don't know where this thing, this thing came from, but I kept things like this because it's good for show and tell for this purpose. This is actually a synthetic chamois oh. versus that leather hide that people yeah. used to use, which was a chamois back then. So this would absorb water really well, but it was very short-lived. You could do small sections at a time, and you'd have to wring it out multiple times before you can get to the next panel. If you're outside or a mobile detailer like I was, this was not very efficient. Mm. So I actually used, believe it or not, people are going to freak out, I used a silicone water blade a water blade yeah as a mobile detailer and it worked well for me but what i didn't realize was even those have a chance of scratching the paint sure so you compare this to something like a towel like this which is called a pfm drying towel mm -hmm. this will just absorb water in one or two passes this will do an average probably three portion 911s let's just do a comparison and you'll never be able to wring that out it'll just keep sucking in water oh wow and it won't scratch the one downside of this is because it's a flat material. Mm -hmm. So think about a little bit of dirt that's still on your paint that won't dislodge, yeah. that you didn't wash off. This is probably gonna hit that, drag it across the finish, Ooh. put a scratch in it. Right, so you talked about the silicone blade, and I used to use that too. And also what I think you have to keep in mind is, what car are you cleaning? Are you cleaning your Concorde car, or are you just cleaning your, you know, your minivan that's a daily driver? And the paint, yeah, we all wanna take care of our paint, but again, the, with the minivan as an example, a water blades can be pretty effective yeah. getting a lot of that water off. I personally don't do that anymore. Now what I do is I use a blower and right. I blow most of the, the, the water off the car. If we, if we really kind of get into the weeds of this, if we start from square one, the day the car was painted at a factory, the moment I just touch that paint with my hand, there's a chance I'm putting fine scratches in there. Right. So think about every tool you're using from towels to water blades to whatever it might be, is it creating more scratches or less scratches? So yeah. those are the things you have to think about. And are you capable of chasing those scratches out down the road? And some people are, they're sort of proud of washing their car all the time. But if your car isn't dirty, you really, sh I don't think you should wash it all the time because that means that's just another time that you're touching the car. Exactly, and then there's techniques in washing. So there's things called foam cannons and we can yeah. break into that real quickly. So a foam cannon is a way to deliver the soap and suds to the surface of the vehicle. And in most cases, if those vehicles are clean, you can actually just rinse it off. If, they're, if they have a good coat of wax on it and they're cleaned on a regular basis, you're going to prevent what's called washed and do scratches. So you're not touching the vehicle as often. So looking at these towels here, now this large one you said could you know, do a full car. So are you blowing off that water or is that just water still all over the car and this will absorb that much water? Well, well so truth be told, you know, in my shop here, which is something, this was my dream garage, and I said, one of these days, I'm not going to have to worry about washing my car in my driveway. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. So in this environment, I've got treated water. I'm not trying to sound spoiled, but my point is I, I geared this shop to my needs. Right. So I can leave the water on my vehicle and not worry about water spotting. Water spots, right. But I can just take this towel and chase everything off. And it, it, it would work great if you're doing this in your driveway because that's going to get the water off a lot quicker. A lot quicker. And you don't have to wring it out because it can dry the whole car with a, right. with the, that. And, that and if you've ever used a towel like that, you know that that towel just, it'll hold about six pounds of water and mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to wring out any water when you're done with it. So can you talk about the quality of these towels? Cause I'm sure all of you have bulk towels that we bought at our favorite bulk supplier. Yeah. Um, and they, they, they work reasonably well for certain things, but I know there's a quality difference between towels that are made specifically for car care. There, there absolutely is. And you know what, I'm guilty of this because years ago I was using terry cloth towels for most of my detailing, wiping waxes off. And what I didn't realize was even those towels have a risk of putting fine scratches in. So your microfibers, what you want to look for is something that's a little thicker and more plush, mm -hmm. something like this versus a flatter, um, what's called a less GSM, grams per square meter. So look at the GSM count on your towels. 
the higher the number and the thicker and plusher it is, the more likely it's going to be softer and, and treat your paint a little bit better. Now, can I ask you, are these are, I'm assuming, are also washable? Yes. And is there any special technique to washing and maintaining great, these? Great question. So a lot of companies, even Griot's as well, will sell a special additive that you can put in with your wash, but I typically use a regular laundry soap. I don't have to buy anything special. No wool light is necessary. The most critical thing when it comes to caring for your microfibers is when you dry them. Don't mm. put your dryer on nuke setting okay. just to heat them up Low to get heat. them dry real quick. Most microfibers are kind of a plastic, so you can yeah. melt those fibers and they become brittle and less efficient in using them as a detailing towel. So uh, what I've noticed when I go to, um, we'll talk about ceramic coating later, but when you go to like a, a you know, the little vial ceramic coating and apply right. it on the car, when they use those towels, the ceramic actually gets hard. It does. So I'm assuming those types of applications, you can't really clean the towel? No, those towels are gonna be trash. They're done. Yeah, they're, they're, done. Okay. they're, they're gonna get brittle, they're gonna be hard because that solvent-based ceramic coating will cure on the towel. And so that's a sacrificial towel. The, okay. the, the installer is gonna throw those out when he's done, so he incorporates that price. Right, because you don't wanna use that later because that now has hard particles right. on that towel, even though you've put it into your wash machine, um, it's not gonna clean that off and then you're wiping a hard towel exactly. on the car. So make, make sure you don't do that. Uh, what, what about um, like spray? Like I know um, ceramic speed shine, for example, there's ceramic in it. Mm -hmm. Does that ceramic get hard? Nope, uh, so we're, we're very open about our products. So ceramic speed shine has a very low percentage of the ceramic. It's designed to kind of maintain a coated car or okay. even our ceramic three in one. It is not a solvent-based product either, so it's washable. So I can wash those towels and not worry about that product being left in the towel. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, what about um, some of the, the wipes that you use with this towel and you wash it, do they become less absorbent? Because I know some of my towels, even though I've washed them, the second time I use them, it seems as though the towel itself is repelling the water I'm trying to wipe up. So I, the first question I would ask if you were to come to me at a show or a venue that we're at, I would say, are you using a fabric softener or a dryer sheet? No. Because in most cases that will leave a chemical in the towel to make them soft and smell good, oh. but that's gonna repel and less likely wick up your detail sprays. Oh, and then that's okay. gonna create its own smear and smudge. Okay, side. so don't don't use a fabric softener sheet, right? Or anything and then, like and that. then the other the other factor of that Vu is because if I'm over drying that towel, that's going to damage the fibers and it makes them less efficient in doing their job. Ah, okay, so that's another big factor. And when when can you tell that it's time to put it in the bucket to do oil checks <laughs> versus cleaning your car? <laughs> uh, so here in my shop, I actually cycle my towels down. So I've got a process. I'm a little bit OCD. I think we all are at some point. My point is, is that I've got a bin of towels that are ready to go to the trash, but I will use them to wipe up an oil spill exactly. or something. Sure. And that towel after that is definitely going to go in the trash. Yeah. So I, I won't throw this out until it's absolutely ready. Okay. All right. More, more, more uh, rules of detailing. Sorry. No, this is, it, this it, is my it, opportunity it, to ask all the questions. It, it's all good. Um, gosh. So to me, the rules of detailing will really kind of go with the do's and don'ts, which I know we had on our list of things to do. So one thing I'm not a big fan of, I've, I've got a little tool over here that I used as a detailer. I'm guilty of this. This is like a magic eraser. Yeah. Not, not to name names, but this is very commonly used for cleaning household things on your wall, fingerprints, and they're stuff like that. They're incredibly effective. They're, they're almost scary effective. Yeah. So I, I admit that this thing will clean things beyond any other tool that I've ever used. I like these on mainly hard surfaces like door sills, kick panels that are not painted or dyed. I will never use this on a vinyl or a leather seat. Because you, you, if you remove the dye, you can't put it back. That's a true sign that this yeah. is cleaning too well. So if you're yeah. using this on a leather seat or a vinyl seat, and the color of that material is coming off on here, you can't put it back on the seat. It's gone. Right. It's removed. And no, it's I know some detailers that love it, but they've either got their technique or they're using it very lightly, and they're trained professionals, so to speak. So be careful if you're using a eraser such as this on yeah. leather or anything that's dyed. Right. And, and can it clean? Absolutely, but it can clean too much. I, I think you just have to know your boundaries, yeah. right? And how far not to push it. Okay. Um, so also when it comes to basic cleaning, so we've got a bucket down here. The most important thing is, is like, you know, tools and, and processes. You want to really get something, whether it's a bucket like this or even a round five gallon bucket from Home Depot, you can buy a little guard or a grit guard. It goes in the bottom and it actually sits up off the bottom of the bucket so that all your dirt and your aggregate that's coming off of your vehicle will settle down to the bottom of the bucket and not let it make contact to your wash tools. Your right, because so if forth. you took, oh, let me put this in. Right in there. 
So now the grit sits below it, and when you go to dunk your towel, you're just all the grits below, and you're not pulling that grip up with the right, towel. And right, right. And, and in some cases, something like this would sit up here, and you can actually take this, put it in the water. You can rub this and get some of the dirt off there, and that's going to settle down on the bottom. Mm. And, and I go even a little bit further than that. I will actually have three buckets when I well, do Well, some wash. people I know do two buckets, right? right? So you have the one where you're dunking to start washing the With car. soapy water. Soapy water. Then and a then clean, then water, clean bucket. water bucket. Then I have one for wheels and tires. Oh, and so that wheel and tire bucket. bucket has all my wheel and tire cleaning tools and even up in my wheel well. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. I've only gotten to the two buckets. I haven't graduated right, three. Right. So maybe I have to graduate to the third bucket. Right. Cool. Gotta step it up a little bit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, um, if you don't mind, let's just kind of take a quick question Go from uh, Lance Johnson. What's the best way to remove track day rubber scuff marks without stripping off the wax? Well, wow, that's a, that's a good question. So we make a product. I, should, I don't want to make this into a Griot's commercial, but we do make a product, and other companies do as well. Yeah. Uh, we have a product called Track Spray, okay. and it is designed just for that purpose. Um, I'm a big fan, too, of maybe making sure you have a good coat of wax on your finish first before you go to the track, and that way that, that material, that rubber, is not gonna to bond to the paint as much. Yeah. And typically it's gonna come off a lot easier. So if you can, pick it off by hand first, rinse it off with water, be very cautious of what you're using, make sure it's safe for the paint, but chances are, if it's strong enough to pull that rubber that's sticking on your paint off, it's probably gonna remove a little bit of the wax protection. And you're gonna to have to go back and just touch it up anyway. Right, now if you have PPF on there, that would be, to me, the best barrier. Okay. If you could put PPF on your lower rocker panels or maybe the nose, across the bumper okay there you go lance hopefully that, Hope that helps, helps out and if you guys have more uh questions on just put it on the live chat here all right so continue on wow so let's go into wheels and tires so i've got a selection of different tools here whether it's a microfiber wheel wand or like a, a nylon? soft like a, it's a really soft nylon brush so you have to think about most production vehicles today almost every one of those vehicles will come with a wheel whether it's an alloy wheel that's either got a clear coat, which is much like your paint, or a powder coated finish. So I always look at the tool that I'm about to use on the wheel as a cleaner, and I say to myself, would I use this on the paint of my car? Mm. Would I run this across the finish? And if I say no, chances are I should not be using that on my wheel. Okay. Um, so the softer the tools, the better. A good tire brush is always adequate, yep, something I have like that this. One. This yep. is great. It's, it's kind of contoured, which is good. It shapes around the tire. But even, you know, a brush like this, these are fine. Some sort of a nylon brush. That's going to get into all the little sidewall nooks and crannies and, and clean it adequately. Okay. And that's the thing is when people are cleaning wheels w with these tools, a lot of people just clean the visible surface right. that and you they don't can get see, back inside the barrel. And, they, and you don't get inside the barrel. And these tools actually get you to go past the spokes inside the barrel to clean them. Um, and also, people a lot of times forget to clean the rubber tire itself. Oh, yeah. They clean the alloy because it's shiny or whatever, but they don't take the time to clean the rubber. And when you go to put some sort of dressing or something on it later, if, you're, if your tire isn't clean, it won't look that good. So you want to clean the rubber just as well as you clean the rim itself. And, and to lead into another issue with that, when you don't clean that rubber and get the old dressing off, yeah. you go to put your next layer of dressing on there, that next layer of dressing is actually laying on dressing not the sidewall of the tire, which is what it was intended for. Right. So people get slinged from that, and that's a big issue with that. Absolutely. Uh, what else? So, um, so I think just getting a collection of products, and you really don't need 9,000 different products, just a basic wash is one. A good kind of a general purpose cleaner for tires and wheel wells and things like that. Even an all-in-one wheel and tire cleaner would be more than adequate. But make sure that that wheel and tire cleaner is safe for all wheels. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing. I would also avoid, and I don't think many companies do it anymore, is an acid-based wheel cleaner. Those are a little bit more detrimental to the wheel. It can create streaking. Um, good toweling, good wash mitts, a good bucket. Make sure you clean your bucket out after each wash. Rinse out all the dirt, ready to go. Make sure your wash mitts aren't sitting in there getting all moldy, things like that. Yeah. So all these tools that I look at are really going to help contribute to and make that cleaning process a lot better. Now, with regards to cleaning wheels, would you recommend, like, you know, there's, I have some of my favorite uh, wheel cleaning uh, sprays to kind of break down the dust. Sometimes people use that same heavy-duty spray to clean it regardless if it's super dirty or if it's not that dirty. And I tend to think if it's not that dirty and if you can take it off, 
with just soap and water, yeah. just use soap and water. Like don't uh, always go to the heavy duty cleaner right. each time. Right, I'm a big fan of just using soap and water when need be. And so the rule of thumb would be, if I have a daily driver vehicle, I would promote washing your wheels at least once a week if you're not gonna wash your car to keep that brake dust from building up on there. Okay. And then maybe every, it depends on your, your driving cycle and your maintenance cycle, but maybe every third or four, fourth washing, get back inside the barrel and clean that really well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question from Paul here. What's the best, uh, the best product and towels for cleaning to minimize streaking? So I guess it depends on if you. So it depends on if he's doing uh, spray wax or if he's doing windows. Oh, I got you. Okay. So just minimizing streaking in general. Does the towel the, make is, a difference? Was he referencing glass or paint? Uh, no, he didn't. Well, so let's let's just use both. Okay, both, for yeah. what it's worth. So. So whether it's a really plush microfiber and even somebody you know, that might find a towel similar to this, which is a PFM, kind of a terry weave towel, these are also used in a smaller format for detail sprays on your paint. So I'm always gonna do a test spot. That's a big thing I'm a, I'm a fan of. When I bring a car into detail here, I am not doing the entire vehicle with six different steps and realize not one of those did the job. Mm. I pick a small test area, probably not much bigger than the size of this towel and I'm gonna do all my, my steps in that one process. And that would include detail sprays and things like that. Oh. Because that way I can, I can back out of the corner a little bit quicker than realize, realizing I did the whole vehicle with the wrong step and the wrong product. I see. Um, so when it comes to streaking, a lot of times if it's a detail spray or a spray wax, there's so many things we can talk about here, but I'll try to really shorten it. Are you over applying? Mm -hmm. um, is your towel contaminated? Is it on a hot surface? Is my towel um, saturated with the product, you know, so little things like that. Do I have a wax or a polymer or a sealant that the detail spray doesn't play well with? Mm -hmm. So less is more. That's my big quote. A light mist is typically better than saturating the surface. When it comes to glass, if it's streaking, I'm a pet peeve on clean windows. So I want to use a quality glass cleaner. One thing I put in my notes to talk about is never use ammonia based products for glass. That's a household cleaner, mm -hmm. especially if you have an aftermarket window tint on your inside. Oh, sure. Because that'll, that'll turn the tint purple and yeah. avoid the warranty. Um, we can really get into a really cool technique where I do the inside of my glass in one direction and my outside glass the opposite direction. Oh. So if my streaks go in one direction versus the other, I know where they are. If and they're inside or the outside to tackle it. Bingo. Oh, that's right. a cool tip. Okay. Yeah. And clean hands. Always start with clean hands, good towel, and a quality glass cleaner. Cool. All right, let's see if we can answer some questions here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. How do you, some William here, how do you restore black painted wheels with oxidation and fading? Black painted wheels. So I, I would address that, and I would just address that no different than I would the paint on my car. Mm. So if they're black and they're faded, typically tells me it's either scratched from aggressive cleaning. I'm, I'm not throwing that out there like it's somebody's fault, or it's just age and fading, or they could be what's called a single stage paint. So mm -hmm. that single stage paint is gonna be more prone to oxidizing. So I'm, I'm gonna take just an average kind of automotive paint polish or a mild compound. I'm gonna do a little spot. Test spot. Test yeah. spot, absolutely. And if I see that luster coming back and that, that product making it look better, then I'm gonna carry on with that until I get the job done. And for, depending on the shape of the, the face of the wheel, if it's, especially if it's a flat area, like I know you have a little micro tool polisher now. Oh, well, well, so we've got right, right behind you here on, yeah, exactly. on, the, on the shelf. So, so I mean, that could really speed up the process. Like if you do a test spot and you know that polishing it up works well, yeah. then you get something like that. And we've got- There you go. And, and then you can- And other companies sell this. So you can get little one inch pads. This will go on one of our dual action polishers and this will make quick work. Yeah, quick work, yeah. I'm all about efficiency and, and working Way better smarter. than doing it by hand. <laughs> if I told stories about the days when I had my detailing business and what I had to use because I didn't have any other choice. So technology has come a long way. So one of my favorite products over here and back in the day, I learned off of this. Now right. this is, you know, many of you have probably used uh, cleaning clays and you have to use some sort of water lubricant. or lubricant right. to ride across and pulls contaminants off of um, the surface of the car. However, this stuff can be interesting to use because it is clay and especially if it's, um, you know, if you drop it, you're done because it's picked up grit from the ground. Right. And then a few years ago, you showed me this and it's one of my favorite, um, my favorite things to use on a car. 
Uh, that one I haven't used yet, but I assume it's pretty much the same thing. This is just more surface area. It is, yep. But this is a fine surface prep mitt that acts like a cleaning clay. And again, you could wash your car, or I do this, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, use this on your car, you're washing it with soapy water, and you have some sort of liquid on it to keep it slick, and then you're just gliding this over the surface of the paint, and when you're done, this paint is super smooth. And I feel like that's how like you get the base set for whatever you're trying to do next to make it shine. Exactly. So back when I had my detailing business, clay was just really kind of getting into the market, and it was traditional clay like what's in this container. Yeah. And clays have come a long way as far as technology goes. We just sell for paint one particular grade of clay. Mm -hmm. We want to find one that's perfectly safe. It's not going to mar and dull the finish. Um, so this is our fine surface prep mitt. And this is actually the tool I use. I prefer this over traditional clay, mainly for me, because in here I've got a larger footprint, yep. so more contact area. This is a great tool um, if you compare the size and, and the contact area. So this is going to cover a larger surface a lot quicker. This is slightly more aggressive than this. And yep. what I mean by that is this is going to pull the contaminant off a little bit faster with less passes. But with this thing, what I find also, having used the, something similar to this for many years, like this doesn't hang on the paint. Like sometimes you get to like a where spot sticks. where yeah. it sticks. Like, th like when this sticks, it leaves a, a mark that it takes you a little while to take it off the car. But this seems to be just right. a super clean glide and you almost can't do wrong i mean and, i don't want, you can and, but and the, and the benefits of this you mentioned that if you drop this yeah. this is going to go in the trash but this you can rinse out i just rinse it off and keep using it yeah and it lasts a long time it uh, you know it's uh it's not inexpensive but i use it a lot and it makes such a super difference this one will do an average of 75 vehicles this one will do about yeah. 24 and then we actually have a clay towel we have a couple of other clay oh tools. i haven't seen this yeah this, this is, is new. fairly new we just brought that out and oh. believe it or not, the so clay, how do you use this one? No different. I'm going to oh. use it the same way. The most important thing for me when I talk about claying my vehicle, whether it's the synthetic version or the traditional clay, I am using a lubricant. And for us, it's our Speed Shine. That is a traditional lubricant that stays consistent the entire time I'm using it. Oh. Soapy water, you need to use a lot more soap traditionally. Yeah. And I'm not a fan of using it on my surface as I'm washing if I still have dirt mixed in. No, you need to make sure it's clean. Right. So yeah, clean soapy water. A lot of times what I'll yeah. do is I'll wash the vehicle and I will right. come back with soapy water. Right. And I will maybe add my spray detail lubricant as well. So okay. I have two things going on there. Okay. Well, um, colors of the different pads. That's probably something we want to touch upon because I don't, like you have a system or the system that I have at home, like I just match the color of the pad to the label that's on the bottom. Right but what's the difference between all of them? That's a great question. So, you know, when we talk about waxing or polishing or doing what's called paint correction, that is a new term now, paint correction. It's not buffing anymore. It's just called paint correction. Sounds fancier. So this, exactly, <laughs> it sounds more technical. So this is a traditional wax applicator pad. And this is something that, you know, anybody can use to apply a wax. They can even use this to compound and polish their finish. It's super soft. It's not gonna scratch the paint. And then when we get into other pads, these are designed to go on a random orbital polisher. And so we've got a couple of different tools that we use that with. And I would say that for the consumer that has always been on the edge of saying, I'm doing everything by hand and I'm getting to the point where I know if I use a machine, but I'm scared of it, I'm gonna get better results. So that's where the random orbital polisher comes in. It's a great gateway tool. I wanna use that term to really get you between hand application and going too far. To a direct. Over on that, the end of that workbench over there, I've got, that's one of my rotary buffers, one of about nine that I've had over the collection of years. And so that's the tool that the industry still uses today. And this uses anywhere from an eight to nine inch pad. This but is, this is the machine that if you don't use it correctly, you're going straight to the primer. And, and <laughs> But honestly, there's a lot of detailers, myself included, that learned how to polish paint properly with one uh -huh. of those. And so I, I'm used to that tool. I know it very well. And there's detailers that can use that and not ever use an orbital polisher, but this is the tool that causes a true swirl mark or a buffer hologram. Because this is just spinning it's in one direction. Correct. No, and no it, random, and right, randomization. And right, and it yeah. generates heat in the process, and that's uh -huh. softening up your, your clear coat and putting swirl marks in it, along with the compounder polish. So the, the rotary buffer is a different tool than what's called a random orbital, which grab the one, grab that one right there, sit right there. So this is what's called a free spinning random orbital. If you want to grab the little cord right there on the cart, that's hanging right off the edge. So this rotates 
and then you'll see here in a second, it actually oscillates. So that's called dual action, random orbital, DA, it's all the same terminology. So because this moves in two different directions all the time, it'll never spin in one spot and burn your paint. All right. This is an awesome tool for somebody who's a novice and is tired of doing everything by hand and wants to go to that next level and get as close to perfection, if not perfection, on their paint. Without worrying about doing, using something that is too exactly. aggressive Exactly. Like that. So much more efficient, more work time with your product. And the level of how much it quote unquote cuts into the paint can be determined by the compound that you're using exactly. and then the pad that you're using. Because I know I was first introduced to this pad. Right. This is what I call the magic pad. Like right. if you had some serious defects, especially like say on a black car and you want to get something out pretty quickly, like this is my go-to. Yeah. And it doesn't even it doesn't even feel that aggressive. Like you would think this here would be more, but this thing does wonders. So what's funny is it's it's kind of cool that you mentioned that because if you look at all the pads, these are all tools. And so I have choices to pick and choose the product that I want to pair with that pad. Right. In our what's called boss cream lineup, those four bottles in the red pro uh, the red bottles in those uh, last row there, mm -hmm. they have a little label on them, and the label matched these four particular pads to start with. Right, so, so there's your white. So we had and our here's your fast one. correcting cream that went yeah. here. We had our correcting cream. You notice the orange, the orange, kind of a theme going on here. And then we have a yellow and a black label that matched these two pads. And so the density of these pads were really designed to pair with those particular products. But it's a starting point. You're not stuck with that. Right. I can actually use this with that or that. I can use this with either one of these. Mm -hmm. This is a wool and these are two microfibers. So these kind of go up the scale in aggressiveness from here. Yep. Oh, so this goes even more aggressive? It, it does. Really? Yep. I've never tried these. Yeah. So this is a great pad. This actually cuts very well, but finishes as, as nice as any other pad because yep. it's because of the way the wool is, a twisted wool. But the thing is, you have to be Limited careful. Wool. Because this is so effective, sometimes you feel like, I'm going to skip going here and just go directly here because I know it will take care of the scratch. But the problem is, if you don't need this level of cutting, you really should try to use the most minimum abrasive to take care of the problem. You hit the nail right on the head. So the yeah. least aggressive is always optimum, right? Yeah. So if I can start with the least aggressive now, maybe I know that because this is a polishing pad and it goes with our perfecting cream, maybe I know that that's not the starting point. I know my paint pretty well maybe, or I, I've worked on the paint before and I'm gonna take it up another notch so I might jump into the correcting cream and the correcting pad. I can, I can start here and if this doesn't work, and it's not aggressive enough, I have the option of either going to fast correcting cream or keep this the same and move up the ladder with different pads. Yeah, and to keep this not necessarily a Griot show, we're just telling you the system that he has here. But I think it's also important for those that are considering other paint cleaning systems and or waxes or ceramics, know that a lot of this stuff is designed to work together with the right. pad or with the so if you're if you're going cross brands if you use something on your your hood to spray you know as a, as a as a light cleaner and then you go back with a different brand as with a ceramic that's like you said earlier like sometimes they don't mesh and that they will streak because they weren't designed to be together so keep that in mind when right. you're deciding on the system that you're using that you might want to consider their full line as opposed to just picking one and mixing them up you know, haphazardly. And you said the magic word, it's a system. So we design these all to work together. Could I use our pads with somebody else's product? Absolutely. And this really applies to any brand in the industry as yep. a whole. So pick the right product for the right job. And then we're gonna talk about technique real quick. So technique has a lot to do with how these products work. Okay. Meaning you're running the tools, so yep. you have a lot of control with the speed, pressure, and arm speed. So those are things that are factors of how well they work as well. And that's what I love when you come to our events, you actually typically have a hood or you have a car that you're demonstrating on and giving a newbie the same materials doesn't yield the same results that when you're using it. Exactly. Because you have the technique and the experience. But I'm all about putting it in their hand and getting yeah. them comfortable with it and guiding them through the process and explaining why it does what it does. So let's, um, if you don't mind, let me ask uh, this question here. Um, Tom Kapikian, he's a local boy uh, that we know. He um, is wondering, is layering wax like still a thing? Because now you hear all the terms of ceramic, you hear about sealants, but back in the day you would layer wax and build up this level of shine and then kind of work it down. And does, do people still do that? Is that still? 
It, it's a common practice, and I think you have to decide, you know, what are you shooting for? What are your expectations when it comes to layering wax? Obviously, the wax is there for protection. Waxes, by nature, tend to enhance gloss, mm -hmm. anything with a carnauba base or a polymer or a sealant. And then you have to think, well, am I going for a 10? And if I get the 10, should I shoot for an 11 or 12? At some point, you're going to put so much product on your finish that it's going to start going backwards. You might drop down to a 7 because you have so much product on there. So you mm -hmm. have to find that happy medium and that stopping point where you're satisfied. Right. So, And then I guess you have to consider how the car is being used and is that wax protection better than the more modern chemicals exactly. that, that can resist driving you know. and maintenance habits play yeah. an important role in that too exactly. is it sitting outside inside you know where's it parked at during the day okay cool uh, what else did i see on here that oh yeah you had this sponge what the heck is that for oh uh, this is my secret weapon so i've got one of these in every single part of my house every bathroom kitchen sink didn't i see that on shark tank <laughs> it's similar like the scrub daddy i think yeah, yeah. so it's a, it's it's a similar foam but um, this is something that we designed in-house, and I love this thing. This is awesome. It's perfect for wine glasses, if you haven't noticed the shape. It's called an Ergo Wave sponge. I use this. Believe it or not, I could take this on the softest finish, uh -huh. dry, and run it across the hood of my black vehicle and not put one scratch in it. What? Oh, it's, it's crazy. But, but it feels very aggressive. What that primarily is best for when it comes to the car is hard surfaces like door panels, but also for bugs across the front of your vehicle. Oh, oh, really? Oh. Someone did ask a question about awesome. bugs. So this is good to take bugs off Absolutely. bumpers. Yep. Now I'm oh. going to use it with a soapy water and we can get into bug cleaning, but I'm, I'm getting my bugs wet before I'm going to start scrubbing them off. That way they kind of get softer and I use the term rehydrate. Yeah. But that works really well for bugs. Are these finger holes? Because I, <laughs> I wasn't sure. I think they, your fingers found their home right <laughs> yeah. there, so you're good. Okay. All right. Yeah. Huh. Awesome. And is this a Grios project? It is. A uh, pro uh, product? It is. Okay. It's called an Ergo Wave sponge. This thing is awesome. All right, man, everything. I've got my list of things to buy later. <laughs> okay. What else? Uh, what else do we have question-wise? Anything? Question-wise. Let's see. We'll go to um, from Max W. I've had some hard water spots and use a dual action polish to try to remove, but no luck. What do I do? Great question. So hard water spots on the front of the cart. Um, there are products in the industry that are called water spot removers. Okay. And so the hard, the hard water spot is really a result of, it could be minerals, deposits from the environment, things like that. One mistake people typically make is they wash their vehicle and usually a soap that's pH neutral is not strong enough to remove the minerals off the surface. Maybe the loose stuff, but the things that are etched onto the finish, you want to use something like this that will chemically release it. That's a spray on wipe off product huh. and it works remarkably well and it's great for paint and for glass. Okay. If I, you try to polish those and buff them off, a lot of times you'll just embed them back in your paint oh. and they'll not come out completely. So that's the first line of attack right there is a water spot remover. I didn't even know this existed. Yep. That's a fairly new product for us. Huh. A okay. Of, a lot of testing on that. Man, I'm learning a lot. Hopefully you all that are watching are learning a lot as well. Uh, let's, we talked a lot about the exterior of the car. Let's go and answer John Thornley's question, which has to do with the interior. And a lot of our cars have leather. Right. When do you clean versus condition leather? Wow, so that's a great question. I think that for me, I've got a vehicle with leather in it, and um, it's a love-hate relationship. You know, I, I, I love leather because it looks great. It looks luxurious. It feels nice to sit on. But I'm a fanatic about keeping it clean. I think... If you were to clean your leather, you know your interior better than anybody else. Are you the only one that drives it? The driver's seat typically gets obviously the more wear and tear. Mm -hmm. um, so if your leather has a lot of soiling and down into the grain and texture, I'm going to clean it first, right? I want to make sure I clean it to get all the soiling out of there, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to put my conditioner on top of that. Okay. Cleaning it helps to open up the pores too. And I try to clean my leather and condition it on a warmer day so that the pores of the hide are open. You're treating it like as though it's true there, skin. Like skin. Yeah. So true, true leather, drum dyed leather, more of a natural leather is better than a vinyl, what's called vinyl impregnated leather. Those are the ones that have a, have a coating on them mm -hmm. that make them a little bit more resilient. So I'm still going to condition that the same way, but I want to keep that leather nice and soft and supple. Okay. So hmm. I don't okay. think you can over condition yeah. leather per se. I mean, so you're not going to put a an inch of that stuff on there, but you right. just want to get enough on there, let it absorb, wipe off the excess, and be done. 
All right, so my friend has a Cayenne. <laughs> and uh, so new leather is sort of matte and soft, obviously, but a seat that's well-worn. So I'm talking about myself and my Cayenne. My driver's seat is now kind of shiny. Right, that's so, from rubbing and wearing in your clothes, yeah, so polishing is, that leather. So is there a way to bring it back to that sort of satiny kind of finish? I mean, if, if you're smoothing out the leather by you know, sitting on it and moving and rubbing it and polishing it, there's not much you can do to dull it back out, uh, sh short of doing something damaging to the leather. Right. So, um, I can clean it, but it will still it. have that sheen because that's, Correct. it's been polished. <laughs> right, so right. If, if your cleaning process is not changing that and bringing back that original finish, Chances are it's going to stay that way, but definitely keep it clean and, and conditioned okay. going forward. Um, one of the materials, as, as I feel this, it reminds me of a material that I've said a lot of times on video that I'm not a fan of, not because I don't like how it feels, but just how it wears, and that's Racetex or Alcantara on a steering wheel. It feels very similar to kind of like this. What's some tips and tricks for maintaining that? So if anybody's familiar with Alcantara, it, it's a, it's a love-hate relationship with that as well. It's a synthetic suede, but it's also a very fine microfiber. So steering wheels, they tend to get the wear pattern. I think we were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. That's a big challenge because you have a lot of oils on your skin, especially if you're eating and you're putting your hands on your steering wheel, that is gonna to contribute to that Alcantara dulling out and getting oils in there that are difficult to clean out. A, a lot of upholstery will have sections with Alcantara built into it or sections mm -hmm. of the dash. So I'm a big fan of just using a, a quality microfiber towel. A lot of times just water is more than adequate to clean that. So no cleaner? No, no cleaner or nothing on the aggressive side. And what okay. I mean by that is no all-purpose cleaners and no degreasers. Oh, okay. That applies to really anything on the car okay. inside wise. So w we can get into that on another topic, but when it comes to Alcantara specifically, Something that is a lower alkaline based product, something more in the pH neutral category if possible, um, but just straight water is where I would start and see what happens. Okay. So um, much like my driver's seat, if you wear the Alcantara too much, I mean, you can clean it, but I'm guessing you can't really bring back its natural original state. Right, because those fibers are gonna slowly the, wear those, down. Yeah, the fibers right. are worn out. Right. Okay. Uh, here's a question from William. How do you restore stainless steel exhaust tips that have experienced discoloration? Um, so if it's like road tar and carbon buildup, things like that, if your conventional metal polish that you might use, we've got something a lot of companies do as well. It's called ceramic metal polish. Works really well. It's got a really unique abrasive in it as well as the ceramic. Mm -hmm. So once I get that dullness out and I get my luster and shine back, the ceramic will add some protection to it. A trick that's always worked for me is I use what's called four ot steel wool. Steel always, wool, yeah. But it's four ot. It's, it's called four zeros. Okay, yeah. And so it's as fine as it feels like cotton candy in a sense, but it's super soft. And I will actually use that along with my metal polish to add it as a kind of a polishing aid. So the steel wool is fine enough where it, it doesn't it will scratch? Not scratch it. You'd be surprised at how effective it is in, in taking off like carbon buildup and things like that. And then you're going to go back and use your, your metal polish to shine it. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, let's see, we have a question from BP. Any issues with no touch car, wash, car washes um, with their wax and chemicals and water pressure? Now, I'm just gonna say, I really don't recommend car washes, but if you have to, what, what, what are the things you can expect? So it, you think about in a touch, no touch, where nothing physically touches the vehicle to agitate. That's better than being touched. <laughs> right, right, oh yeah. So yeah. if you have to go anywhere, but here's the downside of the no touch, is it's not putting scratches in your paint, but if you just put a beautiful coat of wax on there or a paint sealant or something like that, one of the first things, since nothing touches the dirt to move it off, something chemically has to strip it. Yes, yeah, so, so it's, it's more aggressive a, It's using chemicals. an alkaline rinse that goes on, and the alkaline rinse helps to break the dirt loose, and then that gets rid of the dirt. Then you have a pH neutral soap that comes on there. And then if you're smart enough, you'll pay that extra three to five dollars to get the paint sealant. Yeah. And that's a spray it on polymer. Yeah. And that gives you your shine and your water beading and things like that. So there's benefits to it, but I wouldn't do that weekly or, or monthly. Yeah. And another, since we're talking about the heat dome across the U.S., don't take your hot surface painted car through her car wash because I'm gonna throw my sister here uh, into the discussion. She took her black BMW through and it threw all those harsh chemicals on a hot paint. And even though she went through the rinse cycle, by the time she was at the other end of that car wash, the paint was 
destroyed. And I don't want to talk bad about every car wash in the industry. Not every car wash. Right, but, but you have to think you have about to be careful. If, it, if it's going to happen once, it's going to happen every time you go back through there. Yeah. So just avoid those. And, and you know, if you have to, bring it up to the management. Make sure they take care of those spotting issues. But yeah. you never know. Here's a question from Sam Toscano. What about cleaning, uh, the cleaning process for cleaning canvases, cabriolets? Oh, the, uh, the top. Top itself. Yep. So definitely want to use something on a lower alkaline side of the scale. And so that's where I'm going to make sure I'm going to do this in a shady area. Mm -hmm. And I will grab something like this. This is a really good brush. I would tr try to avoid, if that's a canvas type material, avoid nylon brushes because it can, can mar and, and fray mm -hmm. that canvas top. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a soft, like natural bristle, like a boar's oh, yeah. hair or horse hair. Mm -hmm. This is also a great tool for doing your leather upholstery. But for canvas convertible tops, this is a great tool. So I'm going to do sections at a time, shady area, spray it on. I might even put some soapy water around the perimeter of the vehicle so that anything that runs off there is not going to streak my paint if it's a, oh, harsh, if it's okay. a harsh chemical, yeah. depending on what you're using. But I'm going to use this and just in sections at a time, agitate, rinse, clean, agitate, rinse, and then I'm going to pat it dry. I don't want to use any kind of a terry cloth towel that like a bath towel that's, that's going to leave lint bingo right? okay gotcha yeah so actually you can lay your towel on there let it absorb and then roll it off okay uh let's now talk about engine what can we use to detail the engine oh uh, we have a lot of great products and there's a lot of great products in the industry so engines have come a long way from the days of the distributor cap engine which always you know we got that wet we wouldn't get our engine to start so um when it comes to an engine most engines are all sealed, so all your connectors, all your tubes and hoses and intake and all that stuff. So you can kind of get a little bit more um, free with the products you're going to use, but stick with a proper product that is designed for engine yeah. compartments. And I still don't take a hose or especially a high pressure hose uh, and, and go to town on an engine. I still kind of dab. And, Absolutely. You can, and, turn, you, you, yeah. you can put a little inline valve on your hose nozzle so that you can bring the pressure down if you want. And just use, use some brushes. I mean, I've got a collection of brushes here that I actually use yeah, on these doing engine detailing. These are great for getting mm -hmm. into all the nooks and crannies. I will even have a dedicated wash mitt or two or a towel mm -hmm. that I can use for certain surfaces. Do you have a special engine degreaser? We, we like? do. We, Griot's well, makes something. Well, you have your own version. It's right? called Engine Cleaner. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a really awesome cleaner. It's not so aggressive that it's going to stain and, and etch finishes on your engine compartment, whether it's your plastics or your aluminum. And it's just enough cleaner to break loose all the grease and grime. Cleaning the engine of your car, if you haven't done that before, it's probably the more satisfying things to, of cleaning because you see, especially if you, you're working in a car that, that hasn't had the engine cleaned before, like it's such a dramatic difference to just kind of touch on a couple areas, get into the nooks and crannies. And then afterwards, you have like a, a spray that I use to uh, protect the plastics and the rubbers that, right. that um, is almost like once it's dry, it, it looks like it's wet, but yeah. it's not wet to the touch. Gives it kind of that factory the satin sheen. look, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Without being greasy and grimy, that's going to collect. A lot of people back in the day would spray a silicone dressing all over their engine compartment. Right, and that would actually grab uh, and collect it look, dirt It was not and dust. factory looking. It looked right, way too bad. Right, okay. Um, you had mentioned, uh, and this maybe is part of it, and we talked about this at dinner, when there's something that might spill, like a, a, a fruit juice or something like this. Here we have a question. Uh, I had a bottle of air freshener leak out on my leather seat and now it's stained blue. Is my only answer to dye the leather? What are things I can do to get it out? Wow, so that's, that's the first time I've ever had anybody ask that question in my couple of years of detail. Yeah. So, so I've always get stumped and I always say, you know, let's throw some weird questions out there. And I don't mean that in a sense that that's weird. It's just something unique and different. Yeah. So I always say that make sure that whatever you do when it comes to cleaning, whether it's a stain on your upholstery, fabric or carpet or that leather, be very careful what you use for the first time because it may make it worse, yeah. okay? So you can never go wrong with water, just plain water and a microfiber towel. Okay. Try cold water and then warm water. It's always a safe way to start. Always look for leather cleaning products that are dedicated for leather cleaning because it's gonna be safe for the leather, so chances are it's designed to take out things that are spilled on there or residue-wise. Um, and then if you're getting the majority of that off, then you want to get down into the grain and texture. That's where I'm going to bring in a brush like this to get a little bit more thorough and deeper into the grain and texture of the leather. So if it's blue, I will typically grab a white microfiber if I can get one or a white terry cloth towel. 
because I want to see that color transfer mm -hmm. of the stain I'm trying to remove. And then I know that I'm doing something, I'm making progress. But if it's been on there for a while, don't let it bake in the sun, because chances are, depending on the leather, it can actually absorb and re-dye that surface. So that's where a true leather versus what's called a vinyl impregnated leather may be that barrier between getting it out or you're living with the leather like that or re-dyeing it. Okay. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, uh, those of us that have older Porsches and, and maybe other cars where we're worried about dashes cracking, mm -hmm. I don't know that modern day cars, we really worry about that anymore, but do you have something that you put on dashes to protect it and prevent yeah, absolutely. dash cracks? And, and so we, although we make products for multiple surfaces on your vehicle to treat, protect, and clean, I personally don't use anything on my dash except for our interior detailer and so that for me is a product and a lot of companies sell something like that an interior detailer is a spray much like a detail spray for the outside this is for the inside and i can use it literally on any surface of the interior from navigation screens center consoles gauge clusters and dashes hmm. and it does have a little bit of a uv protectant okay it does not give me the shine that some people may desire. I don't like that. I want yeah. my, my dash to look natural. I remember using something in the past that would make everything shine. Oh, I know. <laughs> that, that was livery. That was, but that was the only thing that you had. And then you got to go wipe the dust <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. Week, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about, we talked about waxes, but let's get into ceramics. Absolutely. And its place in the detailing world. Right. So ceramics, when you think about, let me grab a bottle here real quick. So this is a product we call Ceramic 3-in-1 Wax. It's our first venture into the ceramic world. This is a spray-on, wipe-off, water-based formula. We've all probably heard of the term ceramic coating. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about a ceramic coating, it's, it's a product that comes in a little vial, and there's a solvent that contains the ceramic as your solid, and typically it's considered a high solid coating. And so what it is is the amount of ceramic that's in there will determine the durability, the hardness, um, and that contributes to more longevity and protection. Protection, yeah. Right. So this is a product that a consumer can use and really kind of control the level of protection and still go out and kind of play with their car, meaning I can, I can wipe the paint down, I can polish it if I need to periodically. Typically, when you have a ceramic coating on your car, you've got that coating on there that's going to go through its normal wear and life cycle. It could be anywhere from a year up to three to five years. Mm -hmm. It depends on the brand and, and the quality. Well, what happens is you still have a level of obligation and responsibility to maintain, maintain that car. It's not a force field. Right. Although it's designed to keep your car cleaner and make it easier to clean, you still have to go out and keep clean, excuse me, clean it, wash it periodically. Like rejuvenate the, the properties that it has. Right. Yeah. Or kind of add a booster spray or a topper spray, which typically the, the company that did it, or the installer that did it, should really be educating the consumer how to maintain that coating going forward. So for us, this is a product that a consumer can use on a washed and clayed surface mm -hmm. so that everything's nice and clean and smooth, no control. Dry surface? Dry surface. Okay. That right there, if I put one application on, ideal conditions, normal driving, maintenance habits, daily driver, about nine months protection. Hmm. Realistically, if I wait about 24 hours, let that first application go through a kind of a curing stage, I can still drive it on a nice day, just don't wash it. One more application, 24 hours later, I can get up to a year plus, maybe more. So much more flexible for the normal person that's going to use it at their house. Right. As opposed to a professionally installed full ceramic system. Exactly. And a lot of times that coating that a consumer has applied to their car when they go to that certified installer, the cost of that coating is really not just the product, but it's the labor involved in prepping the surface mm -hmm. and application. Now, can something like this, we have a question from Lance again, can the ceramic spray product be used on the uh, PPF, PPF, the Absolutely. paint protection film? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And there I'm going to really kind of push it to what brand of PPF, and, and this is something we get asked all the time, is we get asked how to maintain the ceramic coating they have on their car and how to maintain the PPF film they have on their car. Shouldn't they, they, should, they, they should have been educated by yeah. the installer. And unfortunately, most people either weren't because the installer didn't walk them through the process. Or they forgot. Or they forgot or didn't ask. Yeah, but and you have to maintain it. Because like I know um, we have a car that has ceramic on it, and we use 
uh, ceramic speed shine. Absolutely. To just you know, like I, I try not to touch it very often, but once in a while you go to a show, you kind of need to do something. Right. And you use something that's going to be compatible with the ceramic that's on there and keep the hydrophobicity. Bingo. Right. Yeah, you so said it. yeah. So man, nailed I did. It. I did. Nailed it. <laughs> I had to practice on that one. Uh, but yeah, you want to use the right product because if you use like a spray all-in-one wax, let's say, that wasn't meant to be on top of your ceramic coating, now you've just changed the property of this expensive coating you put on your car and this new stuff you put on is sitting on top of it and it totally changes the characteristics of the, the system. Yeah, a lot of people ask, can I put a ceramic product on top of my car that has carnauba wax on it? Absolutely not. What's, no. You can, but is it the right thing to do? No, no, because the wax is in the way of the product, the ceramic bonding right. to the paint. So we talked about layering. I think, did yeah. we ever answer that question? So about layering. Yeah, you, know, you can get too much. You can get too yeah. much, yeah. right? So similar situation there is you, you got too much stuff going on right there. So start with a basic foundation and, and follow the guidelines. I hate to say this, but there's a lot of great information on everybody's label. And so follow those directions and guidelines and videos as well if they're Man, I know we're approaching the top of the hour. I still have a couple of housekeeping things, but I want to get out a couple more things here that people are asking from Philip. He's talking about how about foam cannons and the soap, one of my favorite tools. Yeah. But there's a caveat. Like, I love my foam cannon because I use it with a high pressure washer. I'm the not, pressure washer. A pressure right. washer, yeah. I'm not a big fan of foam cannons that's just using from your garden hose, but that's just me. So when we talk about foam cannons for us, we're referring to one that is used with a pressure washer because that pressure from the water going through the wand in through the foam cannon is really creating more foam, especially if the foam cannon is designed to be a foam cannon. Right. So the, the washers or the, the foaming sprayers that go on a garden hose, they're, they're the, kind of the equivalent. They're still delivering soapy, foamy, lathery on a smaller scale car wash to your surface, but you're not going to get the same level of shaving cream or snow foam right. that you would get from a foam cannon. Right. So foam cannons are designed to just deliver just incredible suds and add this thick layer of foam on there. And because of that, it's aerating the product. There's the type of foam cannon that we use and most other companies is going to use a particular pill or some sort of a screen inside there and that's mm -hmm. going to help contribute to the aeration and the adding of the foam as it comes out of the cannon. Right and, and the more foam it has it sticks to your car gives you more time to wash it and everything so if you've tried a foam cannon before but it was with a garden hose it's not truly a right. foam cannon and I can understand why you might be disappointed with that. Try it with a pressure washer because it's night and day difference. It's, it's a world of difference so these products up here on the top, we have our foaming surface preps, foaming surface wash, and our polygloss. These are specific formulas that were designed to go through one of our foam cannons, and they're super concentrated. So they're extremely efficient. It's about mm. one ounce per vehicle is the... Oh, amount. wow. It's, okay. it's crazy how much how little right. product it takes. Uh, let's get the answer for Benjamin. Any tips for scratches on plastic? When it comes to plastic, are they referring to glass? Maybe plastic, uh, maybe a, the, the, uh, the window on the, the cabriolet top. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times, you know, if, if a company, whether it's us or somebody else, sells products that are designed just for plastic, whether it's a plastic cleaner, a plastic polish, start with those first. And also, if you can, try not to rub in circles. You'd mm -hmm. rather want to go in straight lines if possible. And typically, I'm going to do a little section on there on the inside and outside in the little corner. And I'm going to use that as my gauge to mm -hmm. see if it's, if it's just an overall dullness and oxidation or if it's a specific scratch. Okay, so before you do it right in the middle, do it like on the edge right. and see just if it's Just to make sure work. the product's going to work adequately and use clean towels. Make sure you wipe it off with a damp towel first so that you're not taking the dust that might be sitting on there rubbing it into the, the plastic itself. Okay, well, the final question I'm going to answer, this is for Joe P. And we actually have a separate video that you can just look this up. He's talking about, can you talk a bit about headlight restoration and protection? I actually bought one of the Griot's Garage headlight restoration kits, and we have a video. Maybe Manny can pull up the link for that and put it in the, um, in the live chat. So just like that, I told you an hour would go wow. by so quickly, and we still have so much more to 
possibly talk about. If you have more questions, put it in the comments area. And if I can ask Rob, maybe yourself or Lucas or someone from the Grios team can look at those questions later on. And Absolutely. we can continue to answer your questions even though we're about to wrap up the show. So yeah. with that, I just want to remind you, make sure that you, if you haven't subscribed to eBreak News, that's our weekly uh, newsletter. We have performance news. We have Mark Fresh News. Just go to PCA.org and you can sign up. Uh, we have Works Reunion coming up August 18th. If you haven't checked out Porsche Club Insider, our podcast, make sure you do that. We have uh, the PCA Open House September 9th. Hopefully we'll see you there. And of course, we also have a few slots left for the Treffen Gateway to the West in St. Louis. And that is gonna be on September 20th. So with that, everyone, I hope you enjoy the show. Please give us a like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you next time.